uh, it's it's a um, oh can you all hear me can you all see me um, okay it's a great pleasure to be chairing this session on early modern sound and emotion uh, my name is David Irving uh, I usually go by the name of David R M Irving um, and I'm an Acrea research professor. Uh, at the Instituto Mili y Fontanales de Reseca en Humanitats, um, which is uh, in Barcelona and is part of CESIC, uh, the Consejo Superior de Investigaciones C uh, Científicas. Um, and uh, I'm also one of the co-editors of 18th Century Music, the journal published by Cambridge University Press. And so I realized that everyone involved in this uh, event is working on sound in, in different ways. So please do bear in mind 18th century music as a possible home for your submissions, um, looking at the long 18th century. Uh, in this session today on early modern sounds and emotion, we have two speakers. Uh, first of all, we have Nathan Hood, uh, who is the Hope Trust Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and we also have Jennifer Linhart Wood, uh, who teaches at George Mason University, and um, they, they have two quite different papers. We're going to have them one after the other and uh, questions following both of the um, both of the uh, papers at the end, as, as uh, Emily mentioned. Um, so I'll, I'll introduce Jennifer Linhart Wood in, in uh, full detail. Uh, just before her paper, but I'll now introduce Nathan Hood, um, who, as I mentioned, is the Hope Trust Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, his primary research interest is early modern Scottish Protestantism, particularly its emotional and experiential aspects. And his paper today is uh, Aristotle's Politics, Body Ballads, and a Melodic Catechism, the Effective Power of Music in James Melville's Spiritual Propine. Uh, and uh, Nathan, if you could please share your slides, that would be great. Super, thank you very much, David. And uh, I'll just get on full screen. The Protestant Reformation of the Scottish Church in 1560 began the long-term and ultimately successful Protestantization of Scotland. An area of immediate concern for the reformers was the music of public worship. Prior to the Reformation, it was common that only a priest, perhaps with the support of a male choir, would sing during the Mass and other services, usually in Latin. Seeking to return to the musical practices of the early church as they understood them, the Scottish reformers were primarily influenced by their reading of Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you plenteously in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing your own selves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with a grace in your hearts to the Lord. Thus, by 1564, the new Protestant Kirk had published its own metrical Psalter, containing 150 vernacular and metrical paraphrases of the psalms set to 105 distinct melodies. Very quickly, it became standard practice for congregations, including women and children, to sing psalms unaccompanied during public worship. Lay Scots relished their new opportunity to sing enjoyable tunes together in a liturgical context, affirming their shared Scottish and Protestant identity through communal psalm singing. By the 1590s, public worship was, at least in lowland Scotland, for the most part reformed. And now that the Kirk was well established, clerical attention increasingly turned towards music in domestic, commercial, and recreational spaces. Some ministers, such as Robert Rollock, the first principal of the University of Edinburgh, took the view that secular, the secular music enjoyed by Scots should be replaced with a culture of psalm and canticle singing. Yet there was also a substantial group of activist Presbyterians who believed that there was space within Scottish society for a kind of music other than that found within the metrical Psalter. In their view, secular tunes could be retained, sanctified, and even enjoyed if they were set to new God-honoring lyrics. One such proponent of this approach was James Melville. 
Together with his uncle, Andrew Melville, he was at the vanguard of attempts to reform the National Kirk in a Presbyterian direction and to introduce a humanist element to Scotland's universities. In 1586, he became minister of Kilrenny in the East Nuke of Fife, and his attention turned to transforming his new charge into a haven of godliness. As a part of his strategy, in 1598, Melville gifted to his congregation a catechism in verse, which included versifications of the Lord's Prayer, Ten Commandments, Apostles' Creed, and other spiritual lessons set to his congregation's favourite melodies. In the preface to A Spiritual Propine, Melville outlined his reasons as to why he had created this musical catechism. His explanation is worth exploring, not least because it shows how Melville's intriguing philosophy of music intersected with his intense emotional brand of piety and the social dynamics at play within his parish. Thus, this presentation will engage with Melville's understanding of music and how it led him to attempt to purify the tunes enjoyed by his congregation through his catechism in verse. Melville was a keen musician. In his youth, he had enjoyed hearing the metrical psalms, so much so that he learned many of the paraphrases and tunes off by heart, as well as many godly ballads. During his university years, he spent much of his time singing and playing instruments, perhaps from uh, texts such as the Wode Psalter, which you can see in front of you. He also enjoyed writing poems and songs in a variety of contexts. Drawing on his own experience, he recognized that music has an immense power to bring about, quote, a glad and cheerful equability to the mind. Music invoked joy, and Melville thought this was because like draws to like and delights therein, and that wilk delights leave a stamp and print in the memory and move sad the affections that it is not easily removed. Now it is certain that measures, harmony, good order and temperature are the like to the nature of man and most friendly and amiable thereunto. Evidently in the faculties and affections thereof, marvelously moved and disposed be the measures temperature and harmonious melody of music and posy. This abbreviated passage can be broken down into its constituent premises. First, Melville held to what might be called the sympathetic principle. The idea, common in ancient, medieval and early modern philosophy, that at a fundamental level, all things are by their nature drawn to what, towards what they are like. And when they are united with what they are like, they have achieved a state of perfection experienced by humans and animals as joy. Second, Melville thought that music and the affections are like each other and how they are like each other, he gives a clue in the quote, marvelously moved and disposed by the measures temperature and harmonious melody of music and poesy. Music and affections are both kinds of motion. The idea that music was a kind of sonic movement was informed by Aristotle's philosophy of music, as found in the Politics and Problemata. Aristotle had argued that rhythms and tunes resemble moral characters because they are movements, insofar as rhythm can move faster or slower, and melodies can move between higher and lower pitches. Through their rhythmic and melodic motion, tunes can supply imitations which hard, hardly fall short of actual affections. Melodies can present emotions and moral characters to an audience because, Aristotle had suggested, they are a similar kind of motion to that of an affection. This leads on to the notion that affections and passions were considered kinds of movement, the consensus view within early modern treatises upon the subject. Following Aquinas, affections were defined as motions of the appetite. What this precisely means is a matter of debate, 
But in general terms, it can be understood that when we consider an object as good or bad that we've apprehended through the senses, for the film, if we consider it good or bad for the fulfillment of our desires, we are either attracted towards or repulsed away from the object. That which we apprehend as good, beneficial and pleasurable, we incline towards in love, while that we apprehend as evil and harmful, we seek to avoid in hatred of it. This formal motion of the appetite was thought to be physiologically manifested in the dilation and contraction of the heart. If we like an object, blood expands out from the heart around the body, raising the body's temperature. While if we dislike an object, the, body, the blood retracts from the body to the heart, cooling our bodies. And it is this raising or lowering of the body's temperature that was thought to be that which produced the felt dimension of an affection. So when we are joyous, we're feeling hotter. When we're feeling sad, we're feeling colder, so cooler hearts and so on. Thus, an affection was considered a kind of psychosomatic motion. And early modern Scots, including Melville, frequently referred to their affective experiences as motions. Implicit in Melville's argument is that the rhythm of music, what Melville calls the measures of a tune, and its melody, what Melville, like many early moderns, called its harmony, are kinds of sonic movement. Thus, they move the faculties and affections because like attracts like, both are kinds of motion. This magnetic drawing together of a song's motion and an audience's affections establishes the good constitution of the soul, which is experienced as the feeling of delight by the listener. In pleasuring the mind, the song helps the memory very meekle to embrace and keep fast the matter and stirs up and sets the force of the soul's affections upon the song's matter. In other words, for Melville, music's movement of the affections causes the listener to remember and adore the subject of the song's lyrics. Melodies are in themselves morally neutral, perhaps a departure from many views in this period. They just make the audience love, desire and enjoy whatever is presented in the words of the song. So what mattered to Melville was not the tune that is sung, but the lyrics that they augmented and pointed towards. This idea that a song's ethical value was determined solely by its lyrics underpinned Melville's desire to purify rather than destroy the secular melodies enjoyed by early modern Scots. Of concern to Melville was the lyrical content of the songs his congregation enjoyed. He had observed that Kilrenny was a musical community, within which it was the people's custom to sing while they worked to ease the irksomes of your labours and toils. Singing filled the workplaces, homes and recreational spaces of Kilrenny, as the residents enjoyed making music. However, the music sung by the common sort in his parish was, in Melville's view, vain and profane, serving to sop the soul in sin and uncleanness, and stir up the corrupt and filthy affections thereof to evil lusts, and seeking of occasions to fulfil the wicked desires thereof. Melville believed that the music his parishioners enjoyed was having an adverse effect upon their affections. His congregation enjoyed songs which had lyrics with explicitly romantic and sexual themes, indicated by Melville's inclusion of tunes from love songs and poems in his catechism, which he said his congregation knew, such as, Ah, my love, leave me not. What distressed Melville about his community's enjoyment of such music was that the songs they liked presented examples of sexual desire in an approving manner. When enjoyed because of their tunes, the song seemed to stimulate similar emotions, evil lusts, within those who performed and heard such ballads. Consequently, Melville thought that these love ballads would move hearers and singers to experience impassioned romantic and erotic cravings, 
which in turn they would seek to satisfy through immoral behaviours, such as fornication and adultery. The intoxicating influence of music, particularly upon young men, was felt by Melville firsthand, whose love for singing and playing music as a university student was deemed perilous, given that it inflamed, quote, his amorous disposition and pursuit of many lovers, activities which, as an older man, he condemned as the propped shot of Satan, whereby to snare me. Yet, while he managed to stave off these devilish temptations, Melville believed that the enjoyment of romantic ballads was a direct cause of his congregation's immoral sexual behaviour. Melville was a minister committed to the eradication of sin within the parish of Kilrennie, evidenced by his zealous approach to Kirk discipline. Between 1586 and 1601, Melville led a Kirk session that was proactive in its administration of ecclesiastical censure, drastically increasing the number of cases that they assessed. The deed they most frequently punished was fornication constituting 61% of the 270 cases tried by the Kirk session during his appointment. Thus, Melville was worried by his congregation's propensity to sing vain and profane songs because he believed such music had the capacity to excite the lurid yearnings that were the cause of the foremost depraved activity within his parish. Consequently, it was of the utmost priority to replace the demonic music enjoyed in Kilrenny with a godly alternative, a task that could be achieved by writing new lyrics to their morally neutral tunes. Melville's response was to create his catechism in verse. Catechesis was commonplace in early modern Scotland. Ministers and their Kirk sessions ran catechesis classes for children on the Sabbath. Masters of households instructed their families and servants through the catechism. Elders would visit assigned homes to aid in the process of catechesis, and schools taught children to rehearse the catechism, Melville himself experiencing this in his youth. Religious education was deemed important because a memory and understanding of the Lord's Prayer, Ten Commandments, and the Apostles' Creed, the text central to Scottish Protestant catechisms, constituted for the Kirk the principles of the Christian religion, and so were required learning for all Scottish Protestants. This standard of religious knowledge was reinforced by the ritual of the Lord's Supper, as only those who could formally recite and understand the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments were allowed to participate. For this reason, Melville's musical catechism included, in narrative form, versified versions of the Lord's Prayer, Belief and Commands. What made Melville's Catechism unique, at least in a Scottish context, was that it was, to quote him, framed to the common tunes wherewith ye are best acquainted with. And he did this to increase its effectiveness within the parish of Kilrenny. Melville utilised the compositional te technique of contrafactum, the setting of a tune to a new text without substantially changing its music. In Scotland, precedent for setting religious texts to secular ballad tunes was established by a popular collection of pre-Reformation Protestant songs, later published on multiple occasions as a compendious book of godly and spiritual songs, otherwise known as the Good and Godly Ballads. Part of its success was derived from its inclusion of ballads, quote, change it out of profane sangs into godly sangs for the purpose that singers will love their God with heart and mind and cause them to put away bawdy and unclean sangs. Melville, who as a boy learned off by heart the good and godly ballads, employed this method of composition within his catechism. One of the paraphrases in the narrative poem was to be sung to the tune of Ah, my love, leave me not, while his roundel, The Seaman's Shout, it has been suggested was a reworked love poem. By using melodies his congregation knew and enjoyed, 
Melville offered a version of the music that his community liked, which displaced words about earthly love with words, sanctified be good and honest matter. When sung, the melodies of these songs would, he hoped, create in singers and listeners a memory and love for their lyrical content, and consequently, a knowledge and feeling of true godliness. Melville trusted that by singing the catechism, his parishioners would, quote, have the grounds of Christian doctrine imprinted in your memory with delight and pleasure, a knowledge and feeling of their things in the practice of a renewed life that would lead to a sanctified conversation. What he means by this is a change from wicked to godly thinking, feeling, and acting. He also hoped that singing these songs would cultivate an assurance of your election, which was, for Melville, the cultivation of faith, which he defined as a sure belief that God both may and will save me in the blood of Jesus Christ because he is almighty and has promised so to do. Thus, Melville thought that the musical dimension of his catechism, um, sorry, because of its power to evoke joy and thus love and memory for its lyrical subject matter, could create an experiential knowledge and love for the contents of Christian doctrine, which would change the thoughts, feelings, and actions of his parishioners. It's a very holistic understanding of religious education. In other words, Melville hoped that his catechism would convert and sanctify his flock. In conclusion, this paper has briefly surveyed James Melville's reasons for producing a musical catechism. Melville's understanding of music as a kind of motion which moves the affections has been explored and used to situate his intolerance of love ballads and his attempt to create a musical alternative aimed at creating a saving knowledge and feeling of Christian doctrine. What has emerged is that Melville valued music for its ability to evoke a memory and love for the subject matter of a song's lyrics. Music could be dangerous, such as was the case with the bawdy ballads he thought stimulated lust in his congregation and thus caused their sexual misdemeanors. However, when set to godly words, such as in Melville's catechism, a melody could create an experiential understanding of the principles of Christianity a process central to Scottish Reform Protestant ideas about salvation. Thus, whereas some Scots like Robert Rollock thought that secular music should be completely abolished and replaced with the metrical psalm singing of public worship, others like Melville thought that the non-religious melodies Scots enjoyed could be retained, providing they were set to new godly texts, for they viewed their melodies as morally neutral. In all, then, Melville's musical catechism is an interesting case study of how early modern philosophies of music could have a very real impact in everyday parish life. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you so much, Nathan, for a splendid paper. And I'm sure we all have a lot of uh, wonderful uh, reactions and questions to ask uh, a little bit later on. We're going to uh, move to the next paper now, uh, which is by Jennifer Linhart Wood, uh, and it's entitled Special Effects slash Affects, the Music of the Spheres in the Early Modern Theatre. And uh, just to introduce Jennifer Linhart Wood, she teaches at George Mason University and is a member of the editorial staff of Shakespeare Quarterly at the Folger Shakespeare Library. She's the author of Sounding Otherness in Early Modern Drama and Travel, Uncanny Vibrations in the English Archive, which is published by Holgrave in 2019. And I just see in the chat that there is a link to uh, a new paperback edition, which is now available. And she's also the editor of Dynamic Matter, Transforming Renaissance Objects, uh, forthcoming from Pennsylvania State University Press. 
Her scholarship is situated at the nexus of literature, performance and music in the early modern period, and has been published in the Journey, a journal for early modern cultural studies, Shakespeare studies and various edited collections. She and the choir she directs performed at uh, Carnegie Hall in 2019. Uh, and let's all welcome Jennifer. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, do you have any slides to share? I, I do. And thank you so much for that lovely introduction, David. Um, thanks also to Nathan for that, that fascinating paper. I'm so looking forward to discussing that and hearing more about that. And thank you so much to Emily and Rachel for, for organizing us and pivoting to this, this, um, this online format as well. And thanks, Rachel, for that plug. That was so kind and <laughs> lovely of you. All right, pulling up my slides. In his well-known treatise, De Institutione Musica, which became the standard university text for music in the medieval and Renaissance periods, Boethius developed a tripartite schema for understanding and discussing various types of music. There was singing and instrumental performance, known as musica instrumentalis, the harmony of the body and soul, musica humana, and the harmony of the universe, um, called here musica mundana. Following Aristotle, Boethius did not believe that musica mundana was actually audible by mortals. And many scholars in, in the modern period continued to echo Aristotle and Boethius in assuming that the music of the spheres was unavailable to human hearing. How effective experiences of certain mortals who were able to hear it. This paper will survey several examples of the music of the spheres as performed sound in the Renaissance theater to argue that instrumental music emblematic of the music of the spheres was performed in order for characters to model effective responses to celestial music and also to generate impassioned reactions in its audience members as well. The characters' affective responses to the musica instrumentalis that they hear or interpret as musica mundana is in fact predicated on each character's musica humana, the harmony of the body and soul, or what we might today term their passionate or affective responses. These examples also support my contention that the music of the spheres was performed as audible sound in Shakespeare's Pericles in part so that audience members could share in the affective experience of hearing celestial harmonies. The myth of Ur that concludes Plato's Republic and the dream of Scipio included in Cicero's De Republica were both well known to early modern readers and they present the music of the spheres as audible by certain exceptional human beings. In the first case, Plato's Ur was a soldier killed in battle who revived 12 days after his apparent death. Prior to his resuscitation, his soul ventured to the afterlife and Ur was able to see the heavens organized around the spindle of necessity. He observes, quote, that each of the spindle's circles acted as a vehicle for a siren. Each siren as she stood on one of the circles sounded a single note and all eight notes together made a single harmonious sound. The perfect proportion of the ratios of the notes to each other um, outlined here was the same as those Plato described in his Timaeus. Uh, strips of fabric cut from the world so it'll create the same kind of harmony as what Ur is describing. Similarly, in the dream of Scipio, a sleeping Scipio is visited by his deceased adoptive grandfather. Scipio sees the universe composed of nine celestial spheres with Earth located at the center. As he wonders amazedly at the grandeur of what he beholds, Scipio questions what is this great and pleasing sound that fills my ears? That, his grandfather replies, is a concord of tones separated by unequal, but nevertheless carefully proportioned intervals caused by the rapid motion of the spheres themselves. His grandfather continues, gifted men imitating this harmony on stringed instruments and in singing have gained for themselves a return to this region, as have those who have devoted their exceptional abilities to search for divine truths suggesting that both musica instrumentalis and musica humana, the passionate connection between body and soul, allow for perception of divine musica mundana. 
Indeed, the word harmony, like concord, is itself related to human affect and affection, one in tune with oneself and with humankind more broadly construed, was believed to be able to thus hear the divine. Scipio's grandfather concludes that the ears of mortals are filled with this sound, but they are unable to hear it because, of course, we have become habituated to it. Fascinatingly enough, the dream of Scipio was later invoked in Thomas Morley's plain and easy introduction to practical music. In his discussion of, quote, all the names of the scale in English, Morley includes several tables that list the names of the planet along with their corresponding tones. The second table is accompanied by the annotation, uh, which reads, at the end thereof, these words, Marcus Tullius, pointing, as I take it, to that most excellent discourse in the dream of Scipio, where the motions and sounds of all the spheres are most sweetly set down. This very brief account of current ideas about the music of the spheres in early modern, that made their way into early modern England, demonstrates that celestial harmonies were sometimes heard by mortal ears, a theory that was taken up and amplified in the early modern theater. Dramatic entertainments of the period definitively employed instrumental music to stage or perform the music of the spheres, making this phenomenon completely hearable to both characters and theater audience. In James Shirley's Grateful Servant, published 1630, recorders are called for in the stage directions as the character Ludwig questions, ah, what music's this? The motion of the spheres or am I in Elysium? In Davenant's The Cruel Brother, also published in 1630, after his sister Corsa dies, Forrest exclaimed, hark! The spheres do welcome her with their own music and the stage directions here include both recorders, sadly, and she dies, still music above. These examples like those in Plato and Cicero also suggest that the music of the spheres was audible, particularly at the point of death. As I'll, I will discuss, this connection was referenced so often that it likely became a familiar theatrical trope that signaled a, char signaled a character's impending demise to the audience. Davenant's directions for still music could have been performed by the soft tones of strings and above indicates the spatial location in the so-called heavens of the theater, uh, also near where the music room was probably located. Still music is performed also in the double marriage as Castruccio comments, a celestial music such as the motion of the eternal spheres and in John Fletcher's The Prophetess, the titular prophetess, Delphia, conjures heavenly sounds commanding strike music from the spheres. Um, and this is accompanied by the stage direction, symphony of music in the air. At this time, of course, the word symphony was suggested of both a variety of instruments and their beautiful harmonies. All these stage directions call for specific musical sounds to perform the music of the spheres. In several other cases, characters express uncertainty that they are able to hear it, even when audible music is playing that might approximate or reference celestial sounds. In Thomas Goff's The Raging Turk, Corcidus, the youngest son and newly appointed ruler, sings a mournful, mournful air after his father and all of his brothers are killed. The final stanza of his song turns away from his melancholy lamentations and towards his phenomenological observations of what he hears while singing. He thinks I hear the singing spheres tune their melodious strains to mine. His air concludes by describing his perception that he is hearing the music of the spheres sound in concert with the music that he is producing which could have been theatrically performed by the addition of other instruments at this point in his song. And at his heirs conclusion, right below the, the box on the PowerPoint there, um, the stage directions state, quote, he sleeps and enter two murderers who slaying him, bear him away. Yet another instance of the music of the spheres heard immediately in concert with death. Similarly, in Shakespeare's Henry VIII, Queen Catherine imagined herself hearing, hearing celestial harmony as she contemplates dying. She states, good Griffith caused the musicians play me that sad note I named my knell, 
whilst I sit meditating on that celestial harmony, I go to, and the stage directions here read sad and solemn music. Another emotive quality to the sounds um, meant to be performed. Catherine's desire for audible music suggests that her quote Nell might concretely represent that celestial harmony I go to. And the association with a performed music with imminent death was not relegated to the theater alone. According to a contemporary account of the Earl of Essex passing, quote, he willed William Hayes, his musician, to play on the virginals and to sing. Play, said he, my song, and I will sing it myself. And so he did most joyfully. Like Catherine, Essex subscribed to the idea transmitted in Plato and Cicero that a dying soul was more receptive to celestial sounds. That the music of the spheres could be a harbinger of death resonates with another musical performance earlier in Henry VIII. The final lines of the air, Orpheus with his lute, that Catherine's gentlewoman sings describe a similar association. In sweet music is such art, killing care and grief of heart, fall asleep or hearing die. Particularly that concluding line, fall asleep or hearing die, uh, suggests that hearing the music of the spheres, music divinely beautiful like that, which Orpheus played, was recognized as a precursor to death. At least one song contemporary with Shakespeare's Henry VIII rendered the music of the spheres as notated music sung as a funeral elegy. The lyrics of Robert Ramsey's 17th century madrigal, Sleep, Fleshly Birth, address the recently deceased. Sleep, fleshly birth in peaceful earth, and let thine ears list to the music of the spheres. Ramsey's setting also imitates this music of the spheres through elaborate vocal polyphony, some of which is excerpted on the screen. Um, and the phrase list, listen, to the music of the spheres is sung as a round, a repetitive musical form that is itself representative, arguably, of a sphere. The madrigal invites the audience to hear the same celestial music to which it directs the attention of the departed, while also imitatively performing it. In other examples where the music of the spheres is mentioned, there is no evidence that performed music sounded at all. For example, Thomas Tomkiss's academic drama Lingua takes up the questions of who can hear the music of the spheres and what it might sound like. The character Auditus, personifying hearing, insists that he hears the music of the spheres. Common sense asks quite practically, what tune do they play? To which Fantastus responds, I hear the celestial music of the spheres as plainly as ever Pythagoras did. It plays fortune my foe as distinctly as may be. Fantastus, representative of fancy or fantasy, identifies this melody, which we are now hearing possibly, as fortune my foe, a ballad tune often and here perhaps ironically associated with the sinister as Sarah Williams discusses in her in her wonderful book. However, Anamnestes then identifies another tune in conjunction with the music of the spheres, stating the first tune they played was Salinger's Round. In memory whereof since, it hath been called the beginning of the world. And that's what we're hearing in the second excerpt here. To my knowledge, lingua is the only dramatic text that suggests particular melodies as representative of the music of the spheres. And while this continues, although two tunes are named, none of the six editions of this play have any stage directions indicating that music should sound audibly during this discussion between the characters. The mention of specific tunes could be embedded cues to musicians to perform these different pieces. 
If no music was performed though, the theatrical effect is remarkable. The mention of two well-known melodies, ballad tunes, uh, could encourage audience members to hear or imagine these songs as music in their minds. This could emulate, most closely perhaps, the experience of the music of the spheres as a non-audible yet still musical phenomenon, even if all one hears of divine harmony is a ballad tune or two. Auditus concludes that the music of spheres eludes our human grasp since, quote, your duller ears cannot perceive it. Lorenzo and Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice famously agrees. There is not the smallest orb which thou beholdest, but in his motion, like an angel sings, so quarrying to the young eyed cherubins. Such harmony is in immortal souls, but whilst this muddy vesture of decay doth grossly close it in, we cannot hear it. Immediately after delivering these lines, Lorenzo requests earthly music, ordering offstage musicians. This is highlighted on the screen. Come ho and wake Diana with the hymn. The sweetest touches pierced your mistress's ear and draw her home with music. The folio stage direction here reads play music. Although it is possible that music may have been sounding throughout Lorenzo's entire speech, beginning after the directive to Stefano to quote, bring your music forth into the air. Whether or not music sounded in conjunction with Lorenzo's speech about the music of the spheres, it is clear that music sounded after it, perhaps as a counterpoint to Lorenzo's discussion of celestial harmonies, demonstrating a connection with it, or perhaps both. Musical stage directions are even less certain in Pericles, a play at least partially authored by Shakespeare, and one that features a character who definitively describes hearing the music of the spheres. Toward the play's conclusion, Pericles' senses are restored after he is reconciled with his daughter. Noting his sartorial disarray, he calls for his robes, but his attention is quickly drawn elsewhere. But hark, what music! Tell Helicanus, my Marina, tell him, or point by point, for yet he seems to doubt how sure you are, my daughter. But what music? Helicanus replies, my lord, I hear none. None, Pericles questions, the music of the spheres. List, my marina, where sounds do ye not hear? Lysimachus, after opining, it is not good to cross him, uh, replies, music, my lord, I hear. And Pericles continues, most heavenly music, it nips me unto listening, and thick slumber hangs upon mine eyes. Let me rest. Just as definitively as Pericles states that he hears the music of the spheres, <laughs> with equal certainty, Helicanus, Pericles' trusted advisor, says he cannot and he does not. The discrepancy in perception between Helicanus and Pericles poses an interesting question regarding how the theater audience is meant to understand and relate to this moment, this musical moment. Do we hear the music of the spheres through theatrical performance and are thus aligned with Pericles? Or is there no staged music at this point in the play and we like Helicanus cannot hear these divine sounds? The extant early printed text offered little information to answer this question. One of the most popular plays in its day, Pericles was printed in six quarto editions between 1609 and 1635. All five versions derive from the original 1609 printing of the play, which is unfortunate because as Susan Fawcett describes it, uh, this text presents a uniquely damaged version and is the only one of the so-called bad quartos that does not exist in another better version. This is part of the reason Gossett observes that it is unclear whether music in Lysimachus's line, uh, music my lord I hear, is part of the dialogue a misplaced stage direction. Um, and whether I hear is a truncated phrase of Lysimachus, belonging to Lysimachus, or the misassigned beginning of a reassertion by Pericles, which would thus read, I hear most heavenly music. Gossett thus inserts two stage directions for music in the art and edition of the play, one right before Pericles first questions, but hark what music, and one at his later repetition of that question. Because the Pericles portos are so defective, we might turn to 
text related to Shakespeare's and George Wilkins's Pericles for information about this correlative moment. However, one searches for the music of the spheres in vain. In Wilkins's painful adventures, there is no mention of the music of the spheres at this point in the narrative. Rather, it is Marina's voice, her storytelling, though not her singing, that overtakes Wilkins's Pericles. Um, and the story arc is similar to, uh, in the 1510 King Apollyon of Tyre and Gower's Confessio Amantis. While in Lawrence Twine's version, it is his daughter singing that pulls the Pericles figure out of his trance. Because none of these related materials include the music of the spheres, it was likely introduced by Shakespeare and or Wilkins into the stage version of Pericles. But why introduce this phenomenon if not to then stage it using all the bells and whistles the King's Men talented actor musicians had to offer to the theater audience? Besides the fact of a rem remarkable theatrical experience, the approximation of this phenomenon could create is perhaps a more compelling reason that has to do with mechanical production and the sometimes undesirable uh, sounds of special effects. If, as many modern editors suppose, Diana, descends. <laughs> Only four short lines after Pericles hears the music of the spheres and falls asleep on stage, it is likely that audible music was employed for a quite practical reason, to cover the noise of the pulley system and our machine that lured Diana onto the stage. Um, an approximation is <laughs> visible there. Uh, this was the case in Middleton and Raleigh's The World Tossed at Tennis, a mass performed at court in 1620 in which Jupiter descends accompanied by music, uh, which, which he then describes as the delicious music of the spheres. Because the chair and pulley system that lowered the actors down to the stage was noise producing and was derisively termed a quote, quicking throne by Ben Johnson. The use of music in these moments was likely in part <laughs> for a very practical reason. It sonically masked the mechanical sounds of the apparatus while also hourly enhancing the effect of a divine being descending to earth, the main, the main playing area of the stage. In The Prophetess, another play in the King's Men's repertoire, a stage direction reads, while a symphony is playing, a machine descends. Music or noise sounds also in conjunction with theatrical descents when Juno descends in The Tempest, in Cymbeline, where Jupiter descends in thunder and lightning, sitting upon an eagle. In the B text of Dr. Faustus, um, the stage direction calls for music while the throne descends. And in King John and Matilda, a voice sound whilst the barons descend. Oh, and finally, in March assemblers, besides when Cupid, Cupid sings as he descends. For both practical, emotive, and even for metaphorical reasons, and because other theatrical productions in the period staged the music of the spheres in conjunction with performed music, it is likely that the music of the spheres that Pericles describes hearing was accompanied by audible sound, creating an experience where the theater audience would have heard something comparable to the divine harmonies that Pericles describes hearing. In terms of the effective response this creates, not only for Pericles, but also for the theater audience, once again, expectations are confounded. Rather than signaling impending death as in other instantiations we've, we've uh, heard throughout early modern drama, the music of the spheres here creates a dramatic misdirection as Pericles instead experiences joy beyond measure when his ensuing dream vision, like the dream visions experienced by both her and Scipio leads him to a reunion with his reincarnated wife, Thaisa, at Diana's temple in Ephesus. The play's John Gower states from the beginning of this play that the purpose of Pericles is, quote, to glad your ear and please your eyes, and that lords and ladies have read this tale for its, quote, restorative properties. Both the plot and the music of Pericles encourage this effective response for Pericles, a character who endures crisis again and again, yet whose moral compass remains intact through his many trials is presented as exceptional like his classical predecessors. And he hears the music of the spheres when all hope seems lost to him and probably also to the theater audience as well. Furthermore, we, the theater audience, 
are invited and allowed to listen in to the celestial music that signals here divine restoration rather than impending demise. As Aaron Meneer argues, the one place where the music of the spheres might actually be audible on earth is the early modern theater. As this survey of the music of the spheres is invoked and performed on stage in surviving theatrical documents has demonstrated almost all references to the music of the spheres were accompanied by some form of audible music. Most often this music was performed instrumentally and identified by certain characters as the music of the spheres. However, in lingua, well-known tunes were mentioned that could approximate the experience of the music of the spheres as inaudible to the ears themselves, uh, but hearable in the mind. Pragmatically speaking, uh, musical accompaniment to Diana's descent in Pericles would sonically disguise the noise of the descent machinery, but it also added another sensory layer to the spectacular effect of Diana's descent. The theater was a space to, strain, to stage the strange, the spectacular, the otherworldly. In its performance of special and musical effects, translate into the effects, and particularly in this case, the effective responses it could direct and create in its listeners. Staging the music of the spheres as audible sound allowed the audience to believe, if only for a moment, that they were experiencing divine harmonies themselves. Thank you.